So uh, I would also like to extend my warm thanks to Philippe for inviting me and uh, I will come back uh, shortly to how I first connected to Philippe. Uh, I would also like to thank Eric for uh, not only presenting very interesting data but also for introducing many of the basic concepts that we are working according that will make life a little bit easier for me. I will restrict myself to speaking when I speak about the NK cells to one particular function of the NK cells, namely the missing self recognition function. That is when there are activating receptors recognizing endogenous ligands on the target cells, but where self emitted class one molecules are missing. And uh, this is uh, in text, uh, uh, the wording behind this hypothesis. And in the talk, I will first uh, have a, a part that is the nostalgic part, which relates to my first connection to Philip where we uh, uh, developed the proof of principle for this missing self-recognition and uh, when, where I will end by asking, has it taken us from the mice to man, from bench to bed by now? And in the second part of the talk, I will uh, discuss more recent results recently published on how the NK cells, as Eric already mentioned, really adapt to the host environment or more specifically the host MHC class one molecules. And in discussing our model about that, we arrived to a, a question which really questions whether it's possible to harness NK cells in uh, immunotherapy to tumors because, because of the model we are working with. And I would like to end by putting that question in. If there is time, I will also present how we are trying to address that question by going back to the bench. Uh, but let me take you 25 or so years back. First, when we started to work with this and uh, for, to obtain proof of principles, what we did was to select two more cell variants that lacked the MHC class one molecules and which were, when transplanted to normal hosts, rejected by NK cells in these hosts. And they were also killed by NK cells in vitro more efficiently than their wild type counterpart. Now, it was, of course, argued then that maybe this has nothing to do with the loss of MHC class one. There could be a third factor regulating the MHC class one expression and the NK sensitivity. And we felt that if we were going to argue that it is was the loss of MHC class 1, we should study the genetic mechanism behind the loss of MHC class 1. And if they were different in the different variants, that would argue that it was the MHC class 1 expression that was really important. And in addition, if we made that the molecular diagnosis correctly, we could transfect back what was missing in those variants and prove that it really was the MHC class 1 molecules. So I wrote to Philippe, and I was a young, a recent PhD then, uh, and I proposed to do this in his laboratory to come and make the molecular diagnostics. I, I was not, uh, had not published at all this, but uh, Philippe, as somebody said earlier today, is a person who likes IDs. He has good methods that he has developed, and he's also very interested in receiving young persons. So I came to Paris in the, the late summer of 85, and we studied the molecular biology of these variants. And this is the paper that resulted. We combined this also with uh, a collaboration with the Uppsala Perpetuation Group, or Svante Pebo more specifically. And what we indeed were able to show was that the variants had different effects, such as the reduced transcription of the heavy light chains of class one, or block in beta tomaglobulin translation. And uh, actually, interestingly enough, also one variant which is depicted here, uh, which relates to what we wrote in the last part of the abstract here, that maybe these variant lines are not in, only interested for NK cell studies, but also for T cell studies, because this particular variant here had normal transcription as shown in norm, northern blood, blood here for class one heavy chain and light chain. But the heavy chains uh, were completely endo-H sensitive and did not make it to the cell surface. Both them and the, class, uh, the beta-12 microglobin was there, but when we immunoprecipitated with uh, uh, antibodies against beta-2 microglobulin in this variant, uh, they did not co-precipitate the heavy chain as they did in the wild type. And conversely, if we uh, precipitated with uh, uh, antibodies to the heavy chain, it uh, co-precipitated beta-2 microglobulin in uh, the wild type, but not in the variant. Uh, so this was a case of a defective association uh, between beta to microglobulin and heavy chains. And we thought that might be interesting. So after having obtained these results, we went to Alan Townsend, who had just set up the first system to study antigen presentation with the molecular uh, uh, entity behind the antigen defined, the peptides. And we could demonstrate indeed that this cell line, which is called RMS, had an antigen presenting defect and after it had been first to Paris for molecular diagnosis, 
And then in Cambridge for, uh, uh, sorry, Oxford, where Anna Townsend was for additional diagnosis, it went to Jonathan Howard in Oxford, who transfected back the missing TAP2 gene and restored the phenotype and also made the cells NK resistant in that case. So this cell line made a grand tour from Stockholm to Paris to uh, Cambridge to Oxford and came back much wiser. One additional or two points that I want to make from this old nostalgia here is that Hans Gustav Jungen, who was also a collaborator here, my first student, a brilliant student, he is now actually leading a translational unit where they, I think as we are speaking, are infusing NK cells uh, according to the missing self principle. Uh, so we have really come, if I may go before the story a little bit here, to a situation where we have gone from mice to men, from bench to bed. Uh, <coughs> interestingly, uh, there is another collaborator here which is more well known for other things, Svante Pebo, and uh, I want to comment on his career also because uh, Philippe said something the first day here when he said that in Collège de France, uh, the principle is that when one professor retires, it can be, he can be or she can be replaced by a completely different professor in another subject. Uh, and you said that the professor in immunology could be replaced by a professor in Egyptology, implying that there is absolutely no connection between those two subjects. But Svante Pebo, at the time of this uh, collaboration, was not only a graduate student in the lab of Per Pettersson, a medical student at Uppsala University, he was also on the side doing undergraduate studies in Egyptology. And that was what inspired him to go and study uh, DNA from ar archaeological samples, and uh, he has now gone on, of course, to do very interesting studies. He did not go from bench to bed, but from bench to cave, I guess, when he started to study the Neanderthals. So much for nostalgia. So we, we uh, could transfect back to class one genes after this molecular diagnosis and show that they were now accepted. Another pr type of molecular evidence we got was that when transgenic mice came around, we collaborated with Gilbert J, and he showed, we could show with him that when he introduced a transgene, a new MHC class one transgene into the B6 background, these mice would now react bone marrow grafts or tumors of this phenotype, and, and uh, they would be accepted if you introduced the same gene here as you had introduced in the host here, thus showing that you could obtain missing self recognition by subtracting class one molecules from the target or by adding them to the host. And this has been then demonstrated in a variety of systems. It works when you inoculate tumor cells, bone marrow transplants, normal spleen cells. Actually, our favorite assay, the one that Eric alluded to, is when you inoculate a mixture of fluorochrome labeled target cells with high and low MHC class 1 expression, and the ones with high MHC class 1 expressions are then completely rejected uh, unless you remove the NK cells from the mouse. And this is a very easy and robust assay to measure missing self-recognition in vivo, which I will come back to. You can express your killing capacity as a ratio between these cells and these cells as an internal control in the sample. Uh, this works in all uh, uh, locations where you inoculate the tumor cells, except intracerebrally, where there is very low expression of class one in the brain, and for some reason the missing self-recognition doesn't work there, but works in all other parts of the body that we have investigated. And there's evidence from different types of studies that I will come back to that uh, this is really controlled by a mechanism in the host environment that teaches the NK cells which MHC class 1 molecules to regard as cells and to look whether they are absent or not. Uh, so we felt at that time that uh, maybe we could go to the bed with this, uh, or the bedside with this. But we were a little bit nervous, I must say, and I felt, to use the words of uh, Max Cooper, I felt dead as a duck when the first evidence of receptors came, because it turned out that when, when Yokoyama presented the evidence in the mouse, it was uh, receptors in the lectin superfamily, which we know now bind to class one molecules in this fashion. And when the uh, Alessandro and Lorenzo Moretta identified the receptors in the human doing the corresponding thing, it turned out that they were in a completely different gene and protein family, the immunoglobulin superfamily, and they bound differently to the class one molecules. They sit on top here, much like the T cell receptor, in fact. And I thought I can never write in a grant application that our studies in mice will be important to understand the human because they are completely different receptors. But we became gradually more optimistic because it turns out that although they 
are in different families and bind in a completely different manner. The similarities dominate. For example, both of the receptor systems uh, seem to be preferentially recognized in certain class one molecules, but not others. And these are groups of class one molecules, so they don't have the same exquisite specificity as T cells. They are influenced by the peptide, but they are in no way peptide specific as far as we understand today. The signal transduction machinery of both of them, much of which has been worked out by Eric Vivier, is the same. And the expression pattern and the generation of the repertoire, as I will come back to, are very similar for the system. So we believe that you can make studies in mice that can predict what will happen in the human. And uh, we became even more optimistic uh, a few years later in the early 2000s, because what we had predicted that the NK cells should be able to kill when there's something present in the whole, uh, source of the NK cells that is absent from the uh, attacked party, they should also work in graft versus host uh, reactivities, such as graft versus leukemia reactivities. And this was shown actually by Andrea Velardi in mice using a, a combination resembling this one, but also in humans where they were studying retrospectively the results of uh, haploidentical transplantation. That is when you transplant from a mother, father or sibling to a child and you have uh, uh, always one haplotype matched between the uh, host or the recipient and each of the uh, possible parental donors. But in the material, it turned out that you, uh, because the HLAC molecules in the human can be divided into two groups, group one and two, which are recognized by two different sets of key receptors, it turned out that they could analyze their results retrospectively and uh, stratify according to whether there was a missing self-recognition capacity in the growth versus host direction. And what they found then was that if there was such a missing self-recognition potential, there was good evidence for graft versus leukemia effect, but no evidence for graft versus host effect. In fact, the data suggested that graft versus host reactions were dampened if there was such a missing self-recognition potential. And they had some evidence in the mouse that this could be mediated by NK cells killing the dendritic cells, which are required for the graft versus host uh, development, uh, and the NK cells killing the leukemia cells, which would then be responsible for the growth versus leukemia effect. Now, these results have not been repeated in all the materials in bone marrow transplants, uh, and the, I think it depends on whether you, you are using haploidenticals or if you're using non-matched, uh, or sorry, uh, matched unrelated donors. But uh, what we are facing today, I think it's fair to say, is a situation where all the people who are doing bone marrow transplants and for that matter, adoptive immunotherapy for the NK cells, where you adoptively transfer NK cells in this direction, they always take good care to type uh, their uh, donors and recipients for the key genes, the receptor genes, and they also type them for the ligands. So I think it's fair to say that we do not yet, even if we do not yet know whether the NK cells and the missing cells will be useful, it's fair to say that they are continuously considered at the bedside today. And that means that it is important to understand the, how they use the receptors and how they use the receptors to ad adopt. And uh, then this brings me to the second part of the talk, trying to go through what we have found in our studies of mice of how this occurs. And you have to understand a couple of basic rules then, uh, and that is rules that are common between mice and men. So uh, these inhibitor receptors, which recognize class one molecules, they are expressed in a variegated pattern. So HNK cell can have it, a certain receptor or not. The receptors are co can be co-expressed completely independently of each other. And if you then consider N number of receptors, uh, and it's uh, usually so that uh, a typical mouse or human have half a dozen inhibitor receptors, then you end up with two to the n possible subsets of different combinations of inhibitor receptors. So two to the five or two to the six, that makes 32 or 64 subsets that you have to track. And as it's, that is possible to track today with uh, uh, multi-parametric flow cytometry, uh, as I will show you a little bit later. But the crux of here is that many NK cells now in this stochastic game end up with uh, only one receptor, two receptors, and some of them end up with receptors that do not have a ligand in the host where they are developing because the receptor genes and the ligand genes are on different chromosomes. 
And that creates a problem that has to be solved then in order to ensure tolerance here. And that has been addressed by many investigators. So let us just take a look at five or six of the possible cells in a setup of 32 or 64 different subsets. If you happen to develop in a mouse which has only one plus one molecule, the D of D molecule, this particular NK cell is an extremely useful one because it has uh, one inhibitor receptor that recognizes the ligand that is present in the mouse. Whereas this one is dangerous, it has no inhibitor receptor at all. And this one is extremely dangerous because it has only one activating receptor that recognizes the same ligand as this one. So you wonder how will the system deal with these cells? And I will come back to that. And it's going to get quite complex. So I thought I would do with you as I do with the medical students when I teach immunology, that I do it the simpler way first, and then we will do it the more complicated way. And we will compare first with the T cells. So as you know, CD8 T cells, as it should be here, if there is no MHC class one around, there is no positive selection. So you have very, very few T cells in the absence of MHC class one. Now, what about NK cells? How do they adapt to host MHC class one? Well, they don't care really when it comes to the population side, whether class one is there or not. It's the same size of the population. Uh, if you look at subsets, as I just defined on the previous slide, carrying one, two, three, four, five receptors, et cetera, there's no dramatic uh, deletion or dramatic expansion of any subset. So all the subsets that you can identify uh, in the absence of class one are present in a mouse with the class one uh, and vice versa. But there is, are two important differences, and that is that some subsets are expanded and some are contracted when you introduce a class one molecules. And the ones which are expanded are the ones with one receptor and particular one with one self receptor, uh, depending on which class one molecule you have introduced. And the ones that are contracted are the ones with three, four, five receptors. They are much smaller those subsets. But more importantly, there are important functional differences between these different subsets now, because some of them are responsive using the assist that uh, Eric already introduced, uh, and some are hyper-responsive, and it's particularly the ones that have a self-receptor that become responsive or licensed. They are allowed to interact with normal cells and to detect and recognize and act upon missing self-recognition. And uh, this is in text, what I just summarized in the figure. So there are two endpoints here. You have an MHC class one influence on the repertoire at the systemic level, and you have uh, an influence on the single cell responsiveness on each of these subsets here. And uh, this is called licensing initially based on the work by Wayne Yokoyama and based on assays that Eric mentioned, which uh, where you trigger NK cells with activating, uh, with receptors against activate, with antibodies against activating receptors. And you look for a response, a degranulation response or an interferon gamma response. And the, the cells that have seen self with the inhibitor receptor are licensed and responsive and look like this, whereas the cells that uh, do, have not seen it uh, look more like unstimulated cells in this assay. Now, when this one was initially presented in parallel by Wayne Yokoyama and David Rolier, there were two sort of major uh, models to explain what was going on. And uh, there were even debates arranged in Cambridge in the International Enke Workshop where the participant had to wear wigs uh, in a classical British manner and debate which model was correct. And essentially, and briefly, uh, one model, the licensing model says that the Enke cells start as inactive cells and if they encounter an inhibitory match with the receptor that they have been endowed with, or one of the receptors that they have, then they become licensed. Uh, the other model is, is, uh, was uh, uh, presented mainly by David Rollet. It says that the NK cells are active by default, and if they do not encounter a cell, that if they do not encounter matching ligands for their receptor or one of the receptors, then they become inactive or disarmed. And we have worked, and that relates very much to what Eric was concluding, we have worked with the model uh, in our institute, which is a sort of typical Swedish diplomatic compromise. It argues that both the arming licensing model and the disarming model are correct, because NK cells can go in both directions, and they are in fact constantly being tuned upwards or downwards between the fully licensed state or the profoundly disarmed state. And this has been mainly developed by my colleagues in many years, Peter Höglund. And uh, it is very inspired by work 
from a theoretical immunologist who worked at the NH at one time, but is now, I think, in, uh, uh, in back in Israel, Svi Grossman. And he developed this model of tunable activation threshold for T cells, where he argued that uh, lymphocytes and T lymphocytes in particular always continuously interact with other cells. And even if they are not activated by a super threshold signals, they are always uh, calibrating, as Eric put it, their activation threshold, depending on how much of sub-threshold signals they get. And this is, uh, Svi Rossman argued, um, an example of a more widespread phenomenon in biology called adaptation, which is used by in many, many different biological uh, uh, situations. And it allows uh, cells then to uh, calibrate themselves and always uh, be acting in the uh, relative uh, uh, dose response interval where they can act uh, efficiently when they get the super threshold signal. So this tuning hypothesis has uh, some uh, predictions that are listed here. The NK cells should not just be on or off, non-licensed versus licensed. There should be a continuum of different degrees of responsiveness when you interrogate them at a single cell level. And uh, this uh, degree of responsiveness you should be able to uh, relate qualitatively and quantitatively to the amount of MHC inhibitory input that uh, the mice, uh, the NK cells have received, which you can vary in experimental, but also under physiological conditions, of course. And finally, it should be possible to manipulate the responsiveness by uh, moving the NK cells from one environment to the other, uh, or by uh, masking, by blocking their receptors the inhibitory input. And uh, that is uh, something that we will return to in the end. Let me just uh, look at, take you through a few of the data that we have to test these first uh, uh, predictions here. And uh, this is a busy slide, but it's uh, here just to make a few points, namely that like humans, uh, different mouse strains differ in the number and type of uh, 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 receptors that they have inhibitory and activating in the relevant locus, the LI49 locus. In the B6 mouse that we are working with, we are, have to consider five inhibitory receptors. We actually disregard this one because it's expressed on very few of the NK cells and its functional importance is questionable. So we have to consider these four and this NKG2A inhibitor receptor. And uh, uh, we can then uh, develop a flow cytometry protocol to identify all of the subsets, uh, one that expresses all the five receptors, one that expresses none of them, five that expresses one receptor, five that expresses four, and ten of each that expresses three or two. And uh, I will not take you through all the 32 different subsets, but I will concentrate on this one, which is the useful subset, the one uh, which recognizes a ligand in the host that we're going to look at, and this one, which is the extremely dangerous subset. It has no inhibitor receptor, but it has an activating receptor for the same ligand. So it's uh, like comparing dangerous and useless T cells, in a sense. Uh, so this is the useful one, and this is the dangerous one. And we have then a multiparametric flow protocol that Petter Brodin, a student in the lab, developed that uh, allow us to interrogate cells that express only one of the receptors and none of the others. And then we have looked at our predictions by comparing how does this subset do when you have a weak ligand as the only MHC molecule present in the host or a strong ligand. So we constructed a single MHC expressing mice uh, by the help of the uh, knockout mice from Francois Le Monnier. We have compared what happens when you introduce more and more ligands uh, in the cells. I will not show you those data. Uh, they have been published in blood uh, one or two years ago. I will concentrate on data that we obtained recently where we compared a hemizygous dose for the class one ligand and a full homozygous dose here. And that is just coming out in journal of immunology now. So this is the class one expression in the homozygous and hemizygous condition. If you now inoculate into these mice class one deficient spleen cells, in the acid that I told you about in the beginning, you find that the fully homozygous mice are reacting more efficiently. They are more strongly educated, these NK cells, to detect missing cells than the hemizygous mice, uh, which they should be according to the prediction that the, with increasing class, MHC class 1 dose, you should have increased education, licensing, and increased reaction. 
if you now look at uh, Li 49A single anchor cells, the one with the single receptor for this particular ligand, and look in many different mice now how the size of the subset uh, is altering depending on whether you have uh, one or two copies of the class one in, you can see that you have a bigger expansion of this particular subset uh, with, when you have two copies. And it's quite a, uh, it's not a dramatic difference if you're a T cell clone person, but it's a significant difference, uh, the expansion of this subset. And if you compare it to another single positive subset which does not have a ligand in this host, there is absolutely no difference. And then we have interrogated the functional efficiency. I'm not going to show you the raw data, but rather these summary slides where the area of the circle here depicts the size of the subset. And you can see that the size of this useful subset is increasing as the concentration of the ligand is increasing. And in particular, the responsiveness of the uh, subset is increasing. More and more cells can uh, respond when you stimulate the cells with effector functions, and in particular the cells that are polyfunctional that can give three responses as listed here, one cytokine, one chemokine, and the degranulation response, they are increasing. And if you now look, instead look at the dangerous subset, the one with the activating receptor only for the same lag, and you can see that that subset is instead contracting, not dramatically, but at least significantly, and in particular, the responsiveness is going down. So we think that the combination of these two factors in the mouse, uh, but mainly the control of the responsiveness here, the functional responsiveness, uh, uh, ensures tolerance in the system. And uh, this was just these two subsets, but we have, of course, looked at all the subsets. And here you can appreciate this pattern where uh, the columns above the line here indicate uh, receptor combinations that are overrepresented when you introduce the class one ligand in question, and the ones below the line indicate uh, receptor combinations that are underrepresented, that you have the self-recognizing receptor overrepresented here as a single receptor, and also many cells with two receptors become overrepresented, but if you have three receptors or more, you become underrepresented. And we can thus devise a signature for every MHC that we're looking at, how it affects the uh, uh, NK, uh, at the, NK repertoire at the systemic level, and we can interrogate each of these subsets, how they respond. And there are lots of interesting data from that that I don't have time to go through now. So uh, uh, let me just come back now after having shown you some data that test these two first predictions to this uh, prediction here. But because what this says is that it should really be reversible. So depending on the environment where the NK cell is, it should change its capability to reject when a certain MHC class one molecule is missing or not. And uh, this is uh, an interesting prediction, but it's also a sort of a disappointing one, because if that is indeed true, that the NK cells adapt immediately to the environment where you put them in, then they would be not so useful in, uh, uh, in trying to um, in harnessing them for immune therapy, because they would immediately adapt and not reject the tumor in the patient that you were transferring them to, whether it was by hematopoietic transplantation or by adoptive transfer, or uh, whether it is by this approach here. And maybe I will have time to show you some data. Do I still have some time? I know that you're all eager for lunch. So let me take two examples. I will take you through some of the data here and some of the data here. We should be able to do that in five minutes. So we transferred then in an extreme missing self situation from B6 to B6 autologous and from B6 to class one deficient. So here you have a missing self barrier, which is profound. And we like to have that one as mouse experimentalists in order to have something good to test for. And then we are looking at the subsets, the repertoire adapting to the new environment we are asking, and what happens to the reaction of class one deficient cells. Do the NK cells adapt so they can no longer react class one deficient cells as they come into this environment? Is there a transient period where they can do that and then it disappears? And what happens actually? And uh, we make our reconstitutions and follow our mice and it looks much as in the human. It doesn't matter whether you put your B6 NK cells into the class one positive or negative environment, the reconstitution looks the same. Uh, T cells come back rather late as in the human, NK cells come back rather early uh, as Eric pointed out. So what happens now when we interrogate these mice with this missing self in vivo reaction assay. Well, if we put in uh, cells here, normal spleen cells that are class one positive and negative, 
there is not much of a reaction as expected. There are very few anchor cells. But already here, in the B6 to B6 combination, we have good reaction. This is week two here. You can see a normal B6 mouse, how it reacts class one deficient spin cells. And the normal class one deficient mice do not do that. But if you have transferred now B6 bone marrow to B6 cells at week two, you have reconstituted the system. But if you transfer now the B6 bone marrow instead to the class one deficient environment, there is no missing self recognition, not even in a transient phase here. So this is sort of bad news if you want to use this to kill class one, kill, kill tumor cells of the recipient phenotype. But the good news is that if you now do the same assay, but with tumor cells, and we use those tumor cell pairs that we initially studied with Philip, then, and then to the left here, you have the same data that I showed you before, the spleen cell assay, and to the right, you have the tumor cell assay. You can see that there's a big difference. The NK cells that have been transplanted to the beta 2 m deficient environment cannot react beta 2 m deficient spleen cells, but they happily react quite efficiently the plus one deficient tumor cells. Uh, and the, the repertoire, we have studied that also. I will not show you that in the interest of time, but uh, the repertoire has adapted also to the class one deficient environment already at week two. So the conclusion here is that we get adaptation and in vivo tolerance towards recipient cells, but only towards normal recipient cells, the class one deficient spleen cells. The NK cells retain strong capacity to mediate missing self recognition when you challenge them with two more cells. And then we have done the same in an adoptive transfer protocol with the same result. I skipped that and I turned to this last uh, uh, approach here instead. And in this case, you are not moving the NK cells from one host to the other. You are instead letting them stay in the original environment, but you are blocking the inhibitory input by putting an antibody against two inhibitor receptors, or rather the fab fragments against the, these two inhibitor receptors. You're introducing that in vivo, and this was done actually in collaboration with Innate Pharma and Novo Nordisk as a, as a preclinical uh, sort of testing of their concept of inhibitory receptor blockade for clear antibodies. We use B6 mice and we use an antibody or antibody fragments that recognize these two receptors, which are the main receptors recognizing KB in this mouse. And uh, uh, what we expected when we inoculated this was that we should induce reaction of class one positive tumor cells because we felt, because the idea was that if you block the NK cells from using their inhibitory receptors, they will not receive inhibitory signal from tumor cells and they will kill them more efficiently. But we feared also that we, would, would, we should get a weak reactivity also against the normal cells in the environment since they would now no longer be able to signal the inhibitory input when the receptors were blocked. So this is what we expected, but what we found was that we never got any breaking of tolerance towards the normal spleen cells in the environment, and we only could induce moderate reaction of the tumor cells when we blocked the inhibitory receptors. This is published. We had to actually combine this treatment with IL-2 in order to get some efficient reaction, and we then still did not get any reaction of the class one deficient spleen cells. And then as we have continued these studies, we got a surprising results because we found that when we challenge them now with class one deficient cells, the tumor cells that were class one deficient were not uh, affected. They were still very strongly reacted by these mice. But when it comes to the beta two microglobulin deficient spleen cells, the class one deficient spleen cells, there we observed a reduced reaction induced by the antibody, which was completely counterintuitive and very strange. And I actually told the student when she first showed me these experiments, please do it again, do it again, and you know the story. And this is one example of, of these results. Here you can see that um, when you treat these mice with antibody, the capacity to kill the class one deficient spleen cells has gone down. And this is completely NK cell dependent and the tumor cells are still killed. And then it occurred to us, of course, that maybe it's the same thing that goes on here as what we're studying when we transfer the NK cells to a class one deficient environment. The NK cells are becoming adjusted and retuned, so to speak, uh, when the, you have the blocking antibody on the receptor. And we can show that in the same mice, there's a parallel process whereby you induce killing of the tumor cell and uh, gradually you uh, reduce the killing of the normal cells and gradually you also reduce the killing of the tumor cells. And this is quite an important result when going from bench to bed because it suggests that it might be wiser if you're going to treat patient here to treat them with intermittent, intermittent antibody treatment than to keep a continuous blockade. 
So uh, uh, if this really represents hyper-responsiveness, we should be able to measure that in this hyper-responsiveness assay. And uh, I can say that we have done that. And the answer is yes, they are hyper-responsive. So let's skip the data and come to the conclusions and speculations. All the three systems that we have studied, we find that the anti-cells adapt to the new environment, whether you've moved them or whether you blocked inhibitory input. Uh, but that adjustment is only relevant for the normal cells that they have in the environment. They can still recognize missing cells when it's presented in the context of tumor cells, and therefore tumor cells. And therefore, I think it's still useful to try to harness them in these uh, different immunotherapy settings, as explained here. With that, I would like to thank my collaborators, and particularly. Uh, the first two students, Annika Wagner and Stina Wikström, who made most of the results, the unpublished results that I showed here, and Petter Brudin, who made some of the published results that I showed. And since I showed some results also from the studies with Philippe, I think you should have been on this slide. But I prepared an extra slide, and I would like to dedicate this le lecture to two persons. One who represents the wild, the, not the wild, the wise and experienced people, and one that represents the young people, the one that we are going to teach, which we will discuss in the panel this afternoon. And the, the lecture is dedicated to Philip then, and to Esther. And Esther is a baby who was born two days ago. It's my first grandchild, incidentally. And I had, was able to take a photo of her just before going to the airport and going to Paris. So to Philip and to Esther and to the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.